Welcome everyone, today we are going to talk about the authentication and authorization and particularly how those processes were implemented back in the day, why almost everybody ended up using the OAuth and OpenID Connect now, what are those protocols about, how they work and uh, what are the alternatives now. So let's go. Also I would like to mention that this video was inspired by Vlad Dan. I'm working with him at Microsoft here and he also has a blog and YouTube channel so please check the description below, he does pretty huge and interesting things as well. Okay, so before going to the flows itself, I would like to introduce the definitions of authentication and authorization, those are not the easiest uh, terms and definitions whatsoever. So. I really like how Martin Fowler defines those terms, and particularly authentication confirms that the users are who they claim to be. Basically, uh, the technical explanation of this and example in particular would be whenever you type the login and password. Login and password are sent through the network to the server. The server checks whether by that login and password it really has some information and if yes, the server returns most usually some authentication ticket and this authentication ticket could be everything starting from cookies, session ID and finishing with uh, JWT token signed encrypted whatsoever. An authorization defines whether a user is allowed to do something or not. So basically after authentication you have your authentication ticket which contains your identity information, it could be some claims, it could be your user ID, it could be session ID, by which the server later on we will grab your info and stuff like that. And now with this authentication ticket you can go to the server itself to get some data and now server can differently respond according to what authentication ticket you have. And basically this comes with the concept of roles, for example, because now with different authentication tickets, for example, I could be the admin, right? And somebody else could be just a regular user. And in my API, which I developed, I can differentiate different access to different endpoints depending on what role you are. And for example, if my authentication ticket contains a role admin, I will have access to some additional endpoints. And uh, this authentication ticket that has role user will not have those permissions. So this is about the authorization. Let's jump a little bit to history. So back in the day, the typical flow of typical web application looked something like that. So you had your browser, browser sends requests to server, server responds with HTML. Maybe it also included just CSS and JS, but usually JS didn't perform any additional subsequent request to grab some data to browser and to update the view for the user. Usually JS was just for some animation and stuff like that. That's how it looked like back in the day. Later on, people introduced the client-server architecture and now the flow looks like this. If we're talking about web applications, you always have browser for sure. And first call from the browser is the call to the client server. What it means, whenever you are hosting your cool React, Angular, whatever else application, it always has the build binaries, the minimized JS that is stored on the server anyway. And whenever you do your get request, the first request you come to some server, the server loads all those JS, CSS, HTML files to your browser and then browser executes this JS and subsequently sends the HTTP request to the API server, which is server in our diagram. So that's how it works. Also, the architecture could be a little bit different because now you're not coupled to web scene at all. The main uh, actor that is responsible for your data is the server and it is completely separate. It is called backend right now and the client could be everything starting from your browser and web and finishing with your phone, whatever you need, some maybe in console applications, doesn't matter. So now you can introduce mobile, you have your HTTP stack, the RESTful based API and you can easily create native mobile applications 
uh, without touching server at all and without dealing with the with html whatsoever you're mostly dealing with some uh, well-known uh, encoding markup which is usually json xml whatever now let's jump to authentication and authorization processes in those architectures i think we can start with the server side processing kind of architecture and back in the day the application of authentication and authorization usually was some admin panel whatever whenever you need to be able to differentiate two different users and to be able to say what user is admin now and what user is regular user how it worked usually the server serves some register form user filled in this register form sends to server back server stores this user information in the database and uh, just return next time the user using the browser go to the login page it filled in the login page details it sends it to server back server based on the login page request compares with what it has in the database if the server found the particular user with login password it's successful user registered before it exists in database it maybe has some roles whatever server returns the authentication ticket and usually this authentication ticket was session id because before the returning this authentication ticket server also stored something called session this is the context of a user interaction with the web system with your server and browser in turn just saved this session number in cookies or rather server told the browser to save this session id as cookie with set cookie header for sure and now each request browser sends the session id and server in turn each request it checks <laughs> whether it has uh, session id in the cookie gets the session information from database checks is everything okay what role the user has whether it is permitted to call this endpoint or not and based on this either it serves the response back with html or it serves some kind of error i don't know internal forbidden whatever that's how it worked back in the day the drawbacks are huge here because first of all your server is stateful and stateful brings a lot of problems with scalability with performance and stuff like that for sure you can like partition and replicate your storages where your sessions are stored you can use different techniques like storing this in the memory and stuff like that but still it is a little bit overhead and it could be done really better another thing that this kind of architecture overall doesn't provide easy way to add some new clients for example mobile and it doesn't bring your multi-platform so having in mind these drawbacks and a lot of other drawbacks the guys changed the approach from the server rendered based to client server architecture and now the scenes became a little bit different when it comes to client server architecture now we are dealing with two different servers first server is front-end server which is serving the JS binaries CSS and HTML and another server is backend server which is dealing with data and basically data only usually so for now we are loading JS binaries to browser and from browser using the XML HTTP request we are sending requests to the server and getting data populating this data into the DOM into our HTML and uh, bringing the good user experience and other advantages but if it comes to authentication for example and you sending your login and password server checks everything is okay and it responds with authentication ticket okay let's say this authentication ticket is session id as it was before this cookie this particular cookie will be bound to the backend server so it will not work basically because your cookie is bounded to backend server and uh, like it's not that easy now to bring your cookie with xml http request each time and also it still has the drawbacks 
it had before like scalability and performance issue because you have your session store you should check update and work with your session store each time so doesn't look good to be honest okay and what was the solution actually dealing with those session store and checking each time the session if it exists if it contains necessary information or not is pretty expensive so the decision was made people dropped the session based approach and proceed with stateless backend so now people separated the authorization server from api servers and now you have only one server that is responsible for both authentication and authorization and actually it uses cookies but it doesn't use sessions anymore it could but most usually now cookies are self-contained values so whenever you got your login successful authorization server for sure uh, sets some authentication cookies to your browser but those cookies are encrypted and they particularly store the your identity information so whenever it comes to authorization server again it can get those cookies and read the values from cookies itself it doesn't need to go to session store anymore this is this is the one improvement that was done it gives you stateless approach because your state right now in the cookies itself it's not in the session store apart from cookies authorization server now also issues the token and what is token mainly it is jwt token which is well specified you can find the rfc about it as well but in simple words this token is the user data payload it can have some user info like last name first name email birthday whatever and it should it even must have the user id something which is called sub claim you can also read about it it is required for all access tokens and how this token works basically this token has the user info apart from user info in token you also have the signature and this signature is calculated on the way when the authorization server is returning data uh, in this case token to the browser so it has the user data it has some secret coming from somewhere using this secret it signs the user payload and returns both of them user payload and signature now your browser can go to any api which also has this secret anytime any api server that gets uh, any request with this access token jwt token it can parse the user payload get the secret that is stored on this api apply the secret to generate and to calculate the signature and compare calculated signature with the signature in the token if those are the same then the token came from trusted party basically from the our server and this is how it is implemented mostly in modern web applications now your api is not stateful at all you can scale it without any problems in our server you can remember the that user is authenticated using cookies but cookies that are self-contained not session based without any session store authorization server this way can be scaled as well because for now as cookies are self-contained any browser any client can go to any other our server and our server just decrypt the cookies using some secret as well and it will have all the user data now OAuth flow comes into play actually as i described in one of my articles historically OAuth was solving OAuth problems that come up with third-party applications so basically this is not even the authorization protocol at the first place like it wasn't designed uh, as authentication and consequently authentication approach of your first party application so you build an application you decide okay i will use OAuth no usually OAuth was the mechanism for third party applications to use your application without uh, security implications like storing user credentials as well and stuff like that okay the real world example to this one would be uh, let's say you are building custom calendar 
and you would like to use Google Calendar. Google Calendar is first party application in this time and your application is third party application because it wants to use data in Google Calendar, first party application. So Google exposes the OAuth protocol implemented that you can use and the user from its behalf using your application authorizes grants access to your third party application to use the Google Calendar data. Google authorization server provides you some kind of authentication ticket. In this case, it's not cookie, it is token. We will talk about it later. With this token, you can go to the Google Calendar and perform the operations that this user granted your application to perform. That's like main application of OAuth. But nowadays, OAuth and OpenID Connect is mainstream because it is performance pretty one of the best approaches you can do. And people started using OAuth as a first party application solution. For some guys who are curious, OAuth cannot work without authentication. And you can read this in RFC, it can't. But still, OAuth does not provide any specification about how the OAuth syndication should be performed. Even more, the pretty big web applications, for example, GitHub, Google, they are not using OAuth in their first party application. So whenever you sign in to GitHub or sign in to Google, in the network tab, you can really realize that it's not OAuth and not OpenID Connect at all. They are using something custom, which is not specified. Unfortunately, there is no any particular well-known specification for authentication, but modern small applications, and I have about three of them, they are usually the process of authentication is the following. You're creating your first party backend, you're creating uh, authorization server, and your authorization server is designed to be used uh, with your uh, backend. So it's not designed to third party applications anyhow. So this is the pretty interesting point. Another thing I would like to point here is about OpenID Connect because a lot of people don't understand how it works and why do we need it. So basically this is additional protocol, additional layer on top of the OAuth. So if you don't have OAuth, OpenID cannot work. It relies on the, on the processes of OAuth. And it brings one more token, which is designed only for user info. It is not designed for authorization. It is not designed to check the privileges and permissions of user stated in the token. And also additional endpoint, which you can go and also grab the user information. So for example, if in your access token, you don't have email, but you would like to have it, you can use OpenID Connect and get this email, leveraging the OpenID Connect protocol. But unfortunately, OpenID Connect protocol does not describe the authentication process as well. So authentication is still hidden part and everybody is kind of implementing it on its own. Usually you have some instruments and tools in your language. Uh, consider, for example, identity in uh, .NET and mainly you're implementing following the documentation of particular library or, or framework for authentication. So I think that's it for today. If you would like to get more details because I really love to investigate things from the root, deep under hood, you can check my blog or my YouTube channel. Thank you for your attention. Bye.